You know, I passed the first test today when I got here. We, we came from Chatham. My son lives in Chatham and his wife and my one-year-old granddaughter, who is just amazing. I've got pictures if you want to see. But uh, <clears throat> we got here about 930. And, you know, when you come into a church, you don't know where to sit. So we kind of sat back there in the back before everybody started coming in. And when Kayla came in, I asked her where she was going to sit. And I said, I'll sit in front of her. I said, now, does anybody else sit here? And she said, no, because I know one thing about a church. Christians will give you money out of their wallet. They'll, they'll cook you the biggest meal in the world. They'll give you clothes off their back. But don't you dare sit in their church on Sunday morning in their seats because they're reserved. So I had to make sure. Now, if she lied to me, I apologize. It's all her fault. Don't get on me. Okay. But uh, again, my name is Brian Gibson. Uh, I'm Kayla's dad's Kevin. I'm his older brother. Uh, 14 months only 14 months older. We used to fight like crazy when we were little, all the time, until the first time I got beat, and that was it. I, we didn't fight no more after that. So uh, <clears throat> so anyway, gr grew up in Pena. I, I went to high school in Pena. Uh, I met my wife, the most beautiful waitress at the Lake Lawn restaurant uh, down in Pena, Lori Wilcox was her name then. We've been married for 35 years, going on 36 next month. Uh, we got three great kids, three wonderful children. Two of them live in Nashville, Tennessee. That's why we live in Nashville, Tennessee now, because we became grandparents for the first time three years ago, and we just couldn't stay away. And then my son lives in Chatham. Um, but it's been a while since I've been behind a pulpit. Um, when, when I was 29 years old, we moved to Cesar, Illinois, which is down in Southern Illinois, right on Rin Lake. And some of you may have been on Rin Lake, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> and I thought I was going down there to sell insurance. But I found out that I was down there to become a Christian. Uh, one of my clients was the pastor at the Free Will Baptist Church, Hazeldale Free Will Baptist Church. And the uh, he was one of my, and he kept coming to witness me. He, you know, people, even in 1993, people were sending their, check, their checks in in the mail. He came into the office every month to pay his bill so he could talk to me. And he just kept working on me. Um, I, was, I was under conviction for about four years. I sat in the back of, of that church and listened to his sermons, and I knew what I should do. I had grown up in the Pentecostal church down in Pena. I went with my grandma and grandpa, but once I got to be a teenager, I found I thought it was too cool to go to church, and so I, I was out of church. It's not that I never quit believing in the power of God. It's just that I wasn't going to church on a regular basis. Uh, but Brother Gene became ill, and there was times that he could preach and times that he couldn't, and I had preached at a layman's day service, and, and uh, and you know how it is when somebody takes it, when somebody will do it, they'll just keep asking you, right? So nobody else has to do it. And so he would become ill. And so I always had a sermon in my, in my Bible. So if I ever went to church on Sunday morning and he wasn't feeling up to it, I, I could step in for him. Uh, I thought that's the least I could do for him. But he, he went, uh, he, he retired and went down to Nashville. He died probably about 10 years ago. But our church was without a pastor whenever he left, so I know what you're going through. Uh, and actually, we went through two searches. We were fortunate to have a retired pastor come in the first time and, and fill in. Then we, had a, we got a new pastor, and he was there for about five years. He had some, uh, his daughter, 10-year-old daughter was diagnosed with brain cancer, and he just had to, had to, had to change the scenery. And then we were without a pastor again. And then, uh, so I know what you're going through and it's a hard time. But it looks to me like this church is stepping up and realizing that they are the church. Now the pastor is the leader of the church, but you guys are the church and you guys are the ones and I, I really appreciate that. Um, so one of the biggest things I did in my life was I coached for 20 years. Uh, I started coaching football and painting in 1990. I went down to Cesar, coached football, basketball, baseball, track, and actually one day of wrestling. <laughs> the coach couldn't go, so, so there I was. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, 
it, it, it was a, a great place to raise my family. Uh, all three of my kids were saved in grade school and still live for the Lord today, and that, to me, is the biggest accomplishment that a parent could ask for. Uh, coming to Kayla, uh, <laughs> my, my oldest daughter, Valerie, when she was 20 years old, had a stroke. Uh, she had a, a condition called Moya Moya, which is mostly found in young Asian males, and she was a 28-year-old white female. Uh, but she had to have two brain surgeries. And Kayla had came down to my youngest daughter's wedding, and Valerie was scheduled for her, her second uh, brain surgery a year later after she'd had it. And Kayla came down with us. You remember that? We came, went down to Jennifer's and, and stayed with her. And she was just asking a lot of questions about God, about Christianity and things like that. And me and her were the only ones, because Lori had stayed down there with them, and me, and me and Kayla were the only ones in the car all the way home, and I knew she was about ready to, she was about ready to give in. And she was asking a lot of questions, and a couple of weeks later she told me that she had been saved, and it was one of the greatest days of my life, young lady. I'm proud of you, okay? So, that's enough of that. <laughs> I'll get back into the to the to the message today. Uh, I'm not going to go right into the to the uh, to the word, but if you do have your Bibles with you, or if you want to get on your cell phone or or whatever, not not on Facebook, but the Google, uh, we'll be starting in, in John chapter 13 when I when I get to that point. <clears throat> so back in the day, there was a a movie or a TV show about a time machine. And have you ever wished you could go back on a time machine to go anywhere you wanted? Um, what are some of the places you'd like to go? Now, I'm a big sports guy. I, I love sports. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I fell in love with my wife is our first date, we went from Painted to Decatur in the middle of November, and we talked about Cardinals baseball all the way there and back. I knew she was a woman for me, okay? So sports is, is what we do. But I would love to go back and watch a guy like Babe Ruth play baseball. I'd love to see what it was like back then and, you know, the, the enormity of, of him and his legend and things like that. I'd like to go back in history and be at the signing of the Declaration of Independence uh, just to know what was going on then, you know. And I bet those, I bet, you know, it sounds all great now, but I bet those people were up under a bunch of pressures and things like that. And look, and, and uh, hopefully we can keep that freedom alive. But what about going back to the days and walking the streets when Jesus Christ was being crucified? Or even when he was doing his teachings? Oh, our life would be different with that, wouldn't it? Or would it? I'd love to see him in those public places. I can only imagine him sitting on a stool or standing on a rock in the middle of a town and, and witnessing and preaching to the people at a young age. I'm sure then that I would be an even better Christian today. Or would I? I'd love to have been there on the shores of Galilee when he fed 5,000 people with five small loaves of bread and two, and two fish. And he had leftovers, so it had been okay if I was there. I'd have plenty to eat. But I would have, would have seen that in person. And so surely I'd been a better Christian today. Or would I? I'd love to hear him speak the parables that he did. I, I, know, I don't know if you guys like the parables that are in the New Testament, but I just love them. Because it's talking about something so far out, and then you realize that he's really talking about something that can deal with every day of our lives. I know then I'd be a better Christian. Or would I? I would have loved to have witnessed the miraculous healings, raising people from the dead, making a lame person walk. For then I know how great he is, even more than I do today. Or would I? And I'd love to have been there for that trial when Pontius Pilate washed his hands and said, do your thing. And I, would, if I, and I know I would, if, if I'd been there and spoken up, I'd probably been the fourth guy on the cross. So I probably wouldn't, I don't even need to answer that question. Would I have done anything different? As a matter of fact, 
when things got crazy, I'd probably snuck out of town, got back on my time machine and came back because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a part of that and, and be, and be, um, and be, and be put on trial myself for believing in Christ. The truth, the, the, the thing I'm getting at is our Bible is the book of truth inspired by God. We don't have to be there to know that it happened. The young lady was talking about a, the history lesson. This is a history book. This is not a bunch of fairy tales. Even though some of the things that happen in here are miraculous, that only happen in fairy tales, they also happen in this book, and they're true. So let's get into the let's get into the thing. And 58 years old, I got to wear these things sometimes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's start out with John chapter 13, and we'll be in verses 33 through 35. This is when Jesus, this is just before the crucifixion when Jesus was predicting that Peter would deny him. Verse 33, it says, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. But this all then will know that but by this all men will know that you are my di my disciples if you love one another let's flip over to chapter 18 verse 15 through 18 so the first denial Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known at the high priest, to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door said to Pilate, said to Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. He had denied him twice already. And then down to verse 25 through 27. As Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, you are not one of the disciples, are you? He did not it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man who, whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that time, a rooster began to, began to crow. That, that's a very common story in the Bible, but it, it's something that we do every day. Now, Peter didn't do anything any different than any of us do on a daily basis. Peter loved Jesus. He'd been at his side during Jesus' preachings and his miracles. He respected him for the teachings he had given him about life, but he had also did the same thing we all do. He denied him. Instead of standing up, and this, for the same reasons we all do today. He didn't want to be physically harmed or even worse, publicly humiliated because of his love for Christ. And if you think about it, Peter kind of made up for it. He actually led the Pentecost in, in the book of Acts and started this whole Christian movement. If it wasn't for Peter and those disciples, we probably wouldn't be here today. We would still be those Gentiles that, nobody, that the Jews didn't want to talk to. So... I want you to think back of our life. Now, I'm not talking to you directly. My sermons come from preaching to myself, okay? So what I'm talking about in these sermons is things I need to work on too. So I'm just kind of relaying my, what I need. Maybe it'll help you. So I want you to think back this last week. How many of you can think of at least one moment when you could have shared the joy of Jesus with someone, but you didn't. I can think of some. We might say, I'll just let somebody else do that. You know, we'll just let Kayla do that. We'll let Scott do that. Okay? We'll let the preacher do that. Okay? Here's the thing. There is people in this world that 
you are the only person that could talk to them about Christ. Because you have more credibility with them than anybody else in this world. We could bring Billy Graham back from the dead. We could bring the best preacher going right now. But those people don't know them. They don't trust them. They don't know them. They know you. The people you love, the people you know, you might be the one person in this world that can witness and, and, and uh, help a person come to Christ. So how many times were you around people not acting the way you should? But how many times were you around people that weren't acting the way they should, but you didn't say anything because you, you were probably the only one that felt that way? The truth is, it's not easy today being a Christian in a woke world, is it? It's not. I remember back when I first started going to church down in Cesar and Hazel Dell, it was a Wednesday night service, and this was back 20, 25 years ago, 25 probably. Um, the guys, they were talking about, remember the big Ten Commandments being at courthouses and things like that, and you know, the atheists wanted them out of there, and, the, and I remember a guy saying, well, they gotta stay majority rules. Do we still have the majority? I don't know if we do have the majority, so we need to get that back. So how many times this week did, did we have a chance to call somebody, invite them to church, share a story, or even yet, just let them know that you care about them? But you didn't. Telling somebody you love them means a lot more to people than, than giving them money or, or food. If, you, if people know how much you care, they'll, they'll go, to, go to the mat for you. The truth of the matter is this. Although we love God and know that Jesus is our Savior and know that the only way, and I mean the only way to heaven is through him, we still have a hard time sharing that news with other people, don't we? Well, why is that? We have the answer to eternal life right here in this book right here in your lives, right here in this church, but yet we don't proclaim it like we should, like I should. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. I've said before that the worst thing that could have ever ha that can ever happen to me is that somebody that I've known for a long time would ask me if I was a Christian. How terrible would that be if, if you know somebody and they have no clue that you're a Christian? that you go to church, that you believe in God. If, that, if that's the case with me, I haven't, I haven't lived my life for God the way that I should live. I should be a, I should be a disciple for him on this earth. I'm, keep, I'm moving these pages. We're, keeping, we're going. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we'll see, we can see times in our lives where we have failed to share the love for others. Not because we don't want to, but because of some of the petty repercussions that we're, that we're scared of. That is also denying Jesus, isn't it? By not sharing. But there's one man that did not deny Jesus, that was Paul. Now Paul was probably one of the worst sinners that could possibly be. He was a tax collector, he was one of the richest men in the, in, the, in the land, and he persecuted Christians. He would go to their house and kill them. And, he, and when he was on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to kill some more until he was blinded by that light. And Jesus came into his heart and Paul completely changed and became the author of many of these books in the Bible. If Paul can do it, so can anybody else. So how do we go about being proud of Jesus and not denying him? I have three items that may help, and they're not very long. Number one, try, the, and now this is, I'm gonna tell you to try this, but good luck. Try to love him as much as he loves you. Can that be possible? No, God's love is endless. Our love has limits, but that doesn't mean we can't try to be like him, right? Okay? When I was a sophomore in, in uh, high school, 120 pounds ago, I used to be a quarterback. 
okay? People look at me, yeah, there ain't no way, okay? That was a long time ago. Eastern Illinois had just won the national championship, 1980. 79, it was 1986 summer. Polk Cobb was a running back. Daryl Moodry was their head coach. And he was talking to us about goals. And again, this was about football, but it can also be used in our Christian life. And he said, when we started the season, we were expecting to be national championship, national champions. He goes, that was our ultimate goal. He said, so you need to set your goals up here. Don't set them here. Because even if you're here, you're still better than what you would have been. You think about that. Always set goals higher than what you ever think you can imagine. Okay? And achieve. I'm getting, now that's some coach talk here, but I'm telling you, that's, that's the case. Try to love him as much as he loves you. Even though we may not be able to do that, we can still try. Now, of course, it's impossible, but how much do we talk about the people we love to other people? I know sometimes people get tired of hearing about our kids and tune us out. And like I said, I've got three grandkids and they're the most three perfect kids in the world, okay? So I talk about them all the time and I got about 5,000 pictures on my phone to prove it, okay? Don't talk about my kids much anymore, <laughs> okay? It's all the grandkids. But just think about if I took half the time I was talking about my grandkids and talked about God and Jesus and what he did for us and what he can provide for us in eternal life. Why don't we talk about him in the same sense? I don't know. There's a story, and there's, again, sports guy. There was a, there was a baseball player back in the, the it was more pop, popular back in the 2000s and 2010. His name was Josh Hamilton. He was a unbelievable player, had unbelievable talent, but there's a difference between having talent and being able to achieve it. Unfortunately, he was derailed by drugs, alcohol, through his, through right when he was young, injuries, and he really never became the player he needed to be, or that he was expected to be, okay? Guess what? He found Jesus. He rid himself of the drugs. He rid himself of the alcohol. He got himself in shape and became a great player. I mean, a great player for four or five years. One night he hit a home run in a big game. And I got this wrote down because I don't want to mess it up. He, he, I was watching when he said this, and it, it just hit me. He said, you know, some of these guys are going to say, why, well, I'm the greatest, I love it, you know, I'm going to do it again. After all this, after all he'd been through, hit a game-winning home run, what did he say? He said, I give my Savior, Jesus Christ, all the credit and hope that what I did here tonight glorifies him. You don't have to hit a game-winning home run to glorify him, okay? You can glorify him by striking out, even though we don't want to strike out, okay? And we probably won't be on TV tonight or next week, but shouldn't we ask ourselves every night, did I glorify you today? I hope we can. If, we, if all of us do that, this world's gonna be a lot better. Number two, you can never go wrong by doing what's right. You can never go wrong by doing what's right. My high school coach down in Payne, John Blackburn, said that I was a sophomore in high school and our varsity team was undefeated for the first eight or nine games and we got beat the night before. And he set us down on the floor on Saturday mornings and, and he said that, you can never go wrong by doing what's right. We had lost the night before, but he wasn't worried about the losses. He was worried about the way that our players had reacted to that. Now, some of the things that they did are commonplace today. Arguing with the officials, making gestures toward, toward other players. But it, he put it, you can never go wrong by doing what's right. How many times in life are we faced with the circumstances where we have to choose between right and wrong? Right might be boring and it might cost us something. Wrong might be exciting. It might be profitable, it might be popular, but it's still wrong. 
one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it was, it was actually a message that I was going to speak on today. Maybe someday you'll have me back and I'll do it again. It's on the power to choose. Joshua 24, 15. You remember Joshua? He was Moses' right-hand man as those Israelites were, were wandering the desert. Led him across the Red Sea. And then toward the end of his life, he said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have choices every day who we're going to serve. Are we going to choose the Lord? Are we going to choose the, the world? Are we going to choose the devil? What are we going to choose? Every day we have that. It's the same way with Jesus. We're in a situation with non-followers. It's easy to just get along. Go along with it. To agree and sometimes even join in. If, we, if we're in a situation to take a stand for Jesus and we don't because we're afraid of the repercussions it might have, is that okay? It's not, is it? Just remember you can never go wrong by doing what's right. Number three, be as proud of being a Christian as non-Christians are of being sinners. Think about that for a minute. Are you as proud of being a Christian as those non-Christians are of being sinners? We don't, we don't uh, talk about it as much as they do, do, they, do we? It's hard to compete with. Let me be honest. And, and I don't think anybody on here would disagree. There is some sin that is fun. Sin is fun, but it's temporary. It's usually of the flesh. It's usually of the, the moment. And it, and it has repercussions. You know, how many men and women have temporarily uh, succumbed to adultery and it not only destroyed their lives, but it also destroyed their children's lives, other people's lives? How many people have had all kinds of fun partying only to eventually have it result in a marriage in shambles, their children following in their footsteps and, and causing problems in their family, a loss of a job or even a fatal vehicle accident? The sinners, of this, the sinners have the world to make them feel better. If we feel the least bit guilty we can, about our sins, we can turn on the television and say, they do it worse than I do, okay? Or they're worse than I am. Or we can get on Facebook and really feel good about ourselves, can't we? You know, with some of the stuff that's on there. And I know, somebody says, I know a lot of other people that are worse sinners than me. I know I, I can check over there Bobby or Johnny or whatever. They're a lot worse sinners than me, so don't get on me. One of my high school teachers, he was also this is a football coach, but he's a history teacher. And I remember one day in class, he was talking about it, him and his, he was always talking about him and his wife. And he, about how he was, she was always bossing him around. He was being funny about it, but he was always bossing him around. And, and he told her, he says, well, I'm a pretty good guy. I don't go to the bar and get drunk every night. I don't mess around on you. And she said, don't compare yourself to those people. Compare yourself to the greatest people in the world. And think about that. Don't compare yourself to people that are worse than you. Compare yourself to the people that may be above you that you strive to be like. And remember, Power of Jesus getting up there. Okay? Here's the thing. Christians, what do we have? We've got our church family. And the church that I went to was, I love country churches. I love country churches. Uh, we, we averaged about anywhere from 80 to 100. You guys are around 50 to 70. I mean, it's the same thing. We, I love country churches because people know what's going on. They can love you. They can pray for you. They can worry about you. Okay? And they can also hold you accountable. Okay? Sometimes we don't like that, do we? Hey, where were you at Sunday? Huh? We missed you Sunday. What's going on, huh? So we just text back and forth instead of pick up the phone. We also have our church, we got our Bible, and we got our faith. And this Tuesday night, at 8.30 at night, the church is going to be empty. Our Bible is going to be where we left it when we got home Sunday afternoon, and probably will be until we go back to church next Sunday. All we have is our faith, and it never leaves us. It never leaves us. 
That's when we need to say, forget this world and its temporary pleasures. Forget what people might say about me. I am a Christian and I'm proud of it. Even though the pressures of this world are around me, I know that I'm a better person because Jesus lives in my heart. I trust Jesus to lead me. It's hard to do every day, isn't it? It's hard to do with all the temptations and all the distractions that we have in this world. But we, and we don't always do that. But if we're truly proud of being a Christian, we can be more faithful and be a better witness to those we meet. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Becoming a Christian doesn't give you a free reign to not ever have anything go wrong, does it? He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We can overcome the world. When you're a Christian and you die, you will overcome the world because you're gonna be living in perfection for eternal, eternal life. He's overcome the world. It's time for us to continue his reign. We need to live the way he wants to. We don't need a time machine to go back in time and tell us those things in person. We have his words right here in our Bible. John 29 says, Blessed are those who have not seen but yet have believed. We don't have to see it because we believe it because it's right here in the Bible and it's right here in our heart. There's something about having that faith, isn't there? that you know what's right. We'll never go wrong by doing what's right. Now, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a preacher, I'm just a, lay, I'm just a layman, and I'm not here to judge anybody. I, again, I'm talking to myself when I've been talking up here today. But I know one thing, we are all sinners. It doesn't matter if we're 95 years old or 15 years old or, or what's going on, we are all sinners. Some of us have more sin than others, but one thing is certain, to do it is in our nature. Good, but the thing is, again, we're gonna start pointing at people, well, they sin more than me, sin more than me. The thing, that, that's not it. Thing is, God considers even the smallest of what we consider sins as bad as murder. He considers a guy like Osama bin Laden just as much of a child as a small baby until they don't accept him, and then they're destined. But I'm proud to say I'm a sinner that's saved by the grace of God. For no other reason, for the fact that he loved me and you did, that he loved me and you, Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we could be saved. We would do anything for our children, but we would do that. Jesus Christ died on the cross. All we have to do is ask him in our hearts. When you're good witnesses, you may not change the world, but you might change somebody's world. And that's all that, that's all that God asks. He's not asking for Brian Gibson to come up and, and speak on a Sunday morning to change the world, because I don't know how much I could do. But maybe by me asking you to maybe talk to somebody that you know that might change their world. Think about that, it only takes one. Because I can tell you, by Gene Allen coming into my insurance office and, and witnessing to me, it changed my wife, my life, it changed my wife's life, it changed my three kids' life, and it's gonna change my grandkids' life. Because of that one man. And that one man was probably told no a thousand times and probably kicked out of houses. But thank God he came and talked to me. If you haven't asked Jesus into your heart, you might be under conviction today, not because of what I said, because of what God is doing in your heart. I sat in the back of a church for four years down there until I finally took the, took the call and, and, and become saved. I knew I couldn't do it on my own. If you're a Christian and you feel the need to talk to him today, do it. If you're a non-Christian and you need to be saved, all you have to do is pray and he comes into your heart. And I'm sure there's plenty of people here that could, could pray with you and help you and talk to you about that. And God will come into your heart, he loves you. Would you please stand as we pray?
Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be with, be with these good people today. I thank you, Lord, for the message you've put in my heart. Lord, I know they're not my words, they're your words, and I hope, Lord, that something I've said can help somebody here in this building today. I know it's helped me. Lord, if there's anybody here that needs your, that needs your help, that needs you in their lives, we ask that you come forward, they come forward today so that they, they can get an eternal life with you. Lord, if, all of us should look at ourselves daily know and ask ourselves if we glorified you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.